Welcome to the Inside the Sales Playbook show, where on each and every episode, we dive into the actual sales process, systems, plays, and strategies working for awesome sales teams today. No high-level overview or fluff you've heard before. We get into the actual weeds of what some of the fastest growing and most successful sales teams are doing today to drive revenue and actually grow their businesses. We're sponsored by SalesKit. SalesKit is the sales knowledge management and sales playbook tool that takes the guesswork out of scaling your sales with one easy to use system that makes it easier than ever for your team to access the sales knowledge that actually works. And we're sponsored by a book, my book actually, Raise Your Standards, the definitive guide to building seven figure sales. You can get a free copy of the book to help grow your sales, whether you're an entrepreneur, sales leader, or sales contributor at www.getsaleskit.com forward slash book. Now, let's get into the show. Hey, I'm your host, Mark Evans, and today I'm here with Matthew Valortigara. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. Oh, man, I'm so excited to have you here. Well, Matthew is the sales operations manager at Hierology, uh, and that's a company that's raised a whole mess of money, about $29 million in their Series D round. So if you're a company, if you're a sales leader, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, and you're all about growth, well, then this is going to be a great episode for you. Matthew's going to dive in and, uh, and tell us what's working. So Matthew, how about you give our listeners a little bit of context for those that have not heard of Hierology, maybe haven't heard of their story. Um, uh, you know, what do they do? And then how do you, as the sales operations manager, how do you help them achieve their mission? Yeah. So Hireology uh, is about a 10-year-old uh, hiring and talent management platform is how I would describe it. Okay. And at its core, it, it really helps uh, companies come in and overhaul their entire HR process, all the way from talent identification to the actual onboarding of the employee. Um Traditionally, we have been strong in three business verticals. It's been auto, healthcare, and then franchisees, things, personal businesses like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a lot of growth and a lot of traction, we've seen in, in healthcare in the coming months. So a lot of exciting things that have been happening this year, kind of in, in tandem with some of the craziness uh, of the past six months with COVID. Um, and myself, I was brought on as a sales operations manager at the end of last year. Okay. to kind of helped be that bridge liaison between uh, you know, our leadership team and our sales team and the data and all the programs that are running in between. So helping kind of cascade from the top down what we want to do um, from the process standpoint and help the, the sales organization achieve that through a couple of different methods. That's awesome. Yeah, that that sounds. I well, I really want to get into how your business has adapted and how it's changed, especially since you guys are so focused with healthcare since COVID. So I definitely want to get into that. But let's start off on kind of a personal note. You know, of all the things, Matthew, that you could have done. You know, why the hell did you choose to get into sales? Uh, so sales has always kind of been in my blood. My dad had a business that he grew from the ground up for oh, cool. 40 years. So I, you know, I, I, I like to think he was, he was a fabulous dental technician, but yeah. what made his business so successful is, is what a fantastic salesman he was. So yeah. I learned a lot from him at a young age. And I think a lot of my mentors in my early life throughout, you know, grade school, high school, college have, have been strong sales figures that, that I've always looked to learn from that I've always kind of looked up to. So I think you know, that in, in tandem with, with, with my upbringing kind of always pointed me in the direction that I wanted to be in a people business and mm. sales kind of always had my calling card. So uh, right out of college, that was what I was looking for. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so as a sales operations manager, if there's anybody out there listening uh, or watching this that wants to get into sales operations manager, what do you think makes a really good sales ops manager, especially with such a fast growing company that's raised a whole bunch of money and they don't just raise it to hold on to it, right? They use it for growth. Um, so what do you think makes a really good sales ops manager? Yeah, I feel like there's a there's a funny joke in the community that's no one no one went to school, no one really no one really studied to be in sales operations or revenue operations or, or however your organization might title it. Yeah. I think everyone kind of has this unique kind of kind of backstory of how, how they might have found themselves in, in that area. Um, you know, I think that a lot of strong sales operations managers, revenue operations managers, come from backgrounds in sales, but also in program management, uh, things that are kind of heavy in the reading of data. Uh, day-to-day -day basis and helping kind of digest that information for the organization. So I myself came came from a sales background. I, I sold for, for two and a half years mm -hmm. and I found myself throughout the course of, you know, all every sales cycle I was in very, very heavily leaning on the value of the data that we had. Um, 
you know, I was never very much a numbers based sales uh, rep. I was always, um, you know, very, very heavy into analysis, heavy into research, heavy into knowing everything I could about a given prospect instead of just blasting out as many messages as I could. So I think that heavy context on data, that, that heavy emphasis on, on its overall value kind of paired pretty well with my transition into, into an operations role. Yeah, I could imagine, especially being so data focused um, with a company like yours that probably has the tools that can go out then and utilize um, those contacts. And, and with that, that, that's awesome. Well, one of the topics that I, I'm getting a lot of people talking about, everybody's really curious, especially with a, a company that's growing as fast as yours. You know, what does your training and your onboarding process look like? Just about every company wants to know, all right, how do we increase the speed of our onboards? How do we decrease the amount of time they're stuck in training? Um, first, how does your role interface with and how does it impact the onboarding and training at your company? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. I think it's something that, that that's highlighted really well here at Hyrology, where we recently had kind of a transition in how we looked at our sales onboarding, our sales training, and how we kind of get our newer reps up to speed with what it is and how we use our, our, our tech stack and how we kind of do our outreach. So initially, you know, we, we had, you know, a formal formal department of sales trainers that would help with onboarding, that would pilot out these programs, whether it was enablement, whether it was prospecting, they would kind of get them learned on, on these tools we were using over the course of their onboarding plan. Mm. What we found to be the case is that it, it's really hard to be a subject matter expert on five to six different vendors, five to six different technologies, five to six different tools that you're expected to use proficiently day, on your day to day. So yeah. With that transition, what we saw is, you know, one, it, it's hard for that person to be, you know, know all be all uh, on, on what we have going on from our tech stack. And then two, with some of these newer vendors and some of these newer partnerships that, that we're exploring and that we're starting to sign off on, the implementation is not what it used to be. It's not mm -hmm. two years ago where, you know, you have to you pull all of IT, all of operations, all of the parties involved in, in a room for two months and kind of troubleshoot it. A lot of it is so native and it, the integration is so seamless that implementation it isn't as taxing or isn't as manually daunting, I think, as it used to be. Yeah. So I think those two, those two facts um, paired up made it so that our program managers, you know, myself, I, I manage our enablement department as well, kind of take hold of, of the onboarding, of the training, of the strategic iterations, um, because they're, they're, they're the managers of that product. And I think they're going to be the best people at cascading that message down to the sales floor. Awesome. Yeah. What a, what a key insight there and how different departments, right? Different areas that uh, touch sales that aren't necessarily your typical sales trainers are really influencing onboarding and training. So if I was a new rep that was starting today, what does a process look like? How long is it? And let's get into kind of some of the detail of your onboarding and training process. Yeah, I, I think that like there's always like the two week onboarding for most modern you know SaaS companies where it's you yeah. know get to know your neighbor, get to know our product, get to know really you know you know what it is we do, um, what it is we sell, and then I think stretching onto that you you kind of look depending on proficiency level. There's like a three to six month. Let's get to know your tech stack. Let's get to know how we do outreach. Let's get to know your voice. Um, kind of the more strategic, uh, the more strategic trainings I, I would call it. So there's that there's that two week onboarding where it's, okay. you know get to know everyone. Get familiar with your product um, and, and get your settings enabled. And then I think stretching further from that, depending on you know rep proficiency, the level of which we hire them at, there's anywhere between a three to six month curve to get them fully proficient, fully comfortable, fully kind of on their feet with, with, with what it is we're doing and how it is we're running our business. Okay. So kind of two week boot camp. Here's the product. Here's the bathroom. Um, here's, yeah, everything a part of, yeah, how to navigate this company here. And then you're looking at really a three to six month. Now, is that like mentor to mentor, peer to peer? Um, how, how does that kind of longer tail training aspect, uh, what does that look like? Yeah, so we have some pretty good uh, systems in place from reporting packages that give us oversight into how everyone's performing. And that's yeah. not to say, you know, positive or negative. Like yeah. we look a lot past into calls to sets, markets they're calling into, overall health of their book. So I think using and leaning on that reporting package and, and being able to deliver that to their sales managers that to give them uh, the data to coach, to get them equipped. Maybe they need to lean a little bit more on their enablement. Maybe they need to lean a little bit more on, on better researching, better prospecting. But having that reporting, having that analysis ready and handed off to the managers so that they, in their one-on-ones, they can kind of provide that more in-depth coaching and steer that ship in the right direction. 
I think that's kind of the best approach, at least within our organization and how, how we kind of handle it. What are some of those reporting tools for those that are interested in hearing like, what are they using? I want to know so we can use. Um, what are some of those tools and what are some of your favorite tools when it comes to speeding up the onboarding process? Yeah. So uh, the overall tool, we, we recently switched enablement uh, platforms and, and we're on with a company called Groove. And I, I think what I saw unique there is, is, is their nativeness to Salesforce made it so that I didn't have to I didn't have to create a whole bunch of reporting mockups, a whole bunch of reporting mm-hmm. packages from scratch. They had a good indication of what you know a SaaS company is going to care about, what these sales managers are going to want to see. So they came ready with like thirty reports in, in, into implementation, and a lot of it was just iterations, tweaks, customization to, to our business models. But the framework. Uh, was kind of there from, from the get-go. So it, it was a lot quicker. It was a lot more ready. And, and it gave a reporting package, a dashboard uh, model. It, it was able to hit the floor, I think, you know, a month or two sooner than it would have been if we had to craft from scratch. So that's great. You know, highly recommend them what they've been a- able to do. And then using your BI tools, you know, your lookers and, and really understand month over month, how are we improving, I think is incredibly important, especially with the market shifting with, with the recent rebound, the resurgence that we're starting yeah. to see, I think understanding that data, you know, week over week, month over month is going to be super helpful to, to forecast, to budget, just uh, an overall understanding you know, of, uh, you know, who's open to getting sold to right now. Yeah, definitely. You got to have those insights, especially with a team of your size. Um, how do you know when someone's ready and to kind of graduate? Well, first, how do you know when someone's ready and good enough to graduate through that two week boot camp? Um, and then six months down the road, right? How do you know when someone's ready to like either graduate uh, and be on their own or maybe graduate into another level? Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think our organization does, you know, I, it's true in almost all modern sales organizations that, that quotas, you know, I, I think I read something that 50% of them are, were missed in the past year. Like, yeah, we, we do a fantastic job at understanding what's attainable in today, you know, not what was our 2020 budget in, in January, uh, at the start of the year, but understanding what's acceptable, what's happening in our market it, markets, you know, understanding, you know, how is auto versus healthcare. Mm-hmm. And, and providing our reps that uh, peace of mind that yeah. you know w- w- we're aware of the changes, we're aware that there's a world pandemic going on, and that we're we're going to do our best from an analytic and reporting standpoint to adjust those metrics, to adjust those KPIs, to make sure that we're in line with what's happening. So it's being realistic. So that, yeah. So that being said, we have realistic, re- real time updates that we're we're updating. You know, I want to say conversations are happening week over week with adjustments happening month over month, depending on what we see in the market, so that. We can really hold true to our KPIs. We can really hold true to these these metrics that that, that, that we kind of tie ourselves to at, at the end of the week. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really good. Well, let's since this is the Inside the Sales Playbook show, let's talk a little bit more about your actual sales playbook and what's working with your sales team currently. Um, but first, start us off with what does your current sales structure look like? Uh, inside, outside, SDRs, account managers, uh, you know, customer success managers. What does that look like? And has any of that changed due to COVID nineteen? Yeah. So we have. Uh, three different sales teams here at Irology, and I think it's remained pretty consistent w- with COVID. Little intricate changes amongst the reps, but the three teams and their construct hasn't changed too much. And the way we look at it is we have our BDRs that are helping kind of drive that top of funnel, that engagement, getting getting the Irology name out there um, and setting up some meetings for our next department, which is our quota carriers. These are yep. our ARs, our AEs, our ADs, um, reps that have active quotas that are um, taking these meetings, demoing the product, and looking to close deals. So, and how many BDRs versus AEs? So I think we have about uh, 10 BDRs and, and between 12 or 13 uh, quota carriers. As we like okay. And is that enough BDRs or SDRs to really fill the pipeline for those account uh, executives? So we played around with in terms of, you know, is it one-to-one? Does an AE yeah. get a BDR? Do we do a pool model? Do, you know, we, we put them on our lowest hanging fruit. Maybe that's, you know, some of our smaller groups, some of our small to mid-market business. We played around and we changed the algorithm a lot in terms of what's working with us. And I think if I were to say it to you today that we cracked the code and we figured out the perfect structure, you know, I would be lying to you and anyone that tells you that should be remiss. Um, yeah. I think that's something that needs to be ongoing, evaluated, depending on, you know, internal structure, it, whether, you know, you don't have the resources for a one-to-one, maybe the pool model doesn't work with your business models. Um, and then external factors, you know, maybe mm-hmm. our auto vertical is a little bit slower or, you know, flip side, maybe the healthcare is a little bit slower and we need to reallocate some, some resources. So I think, 
that's something that should be monitored <clears throat> ongoing okay. and, and changes should always be made to that. So we've been very flexible in that regard. So it's, it's not something that's ever cemented by any means. Yeah, I think that's one of the great equations in sales right now is, all right, how many per each and what's that magic number? And it seems like for each business, it's a little bit different and you guys are still um, trying to figure out that formula, which is which is great. Yeah, I think the question we ask is not how many for each and mm. what's the right formula. It's how often do we evaluate this? Mm. And when when do we make the data actionable? You know, When do we see this month uh, uh, of what this is telling us? Is that is that grounds for a change up? Like, I think that's the more important question, at least internally with us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so 10 BDRs or SDRs. You got about 10 to 12 account executives. Any other, you said there was a third team. What's yeah, the third team? Third, third team is our inbound team. So this is okay. uh, primarily that works our warm leads, our, our MQLs, people that are, are kind of raising their hand and interested um, in, in, in coming to Hireology and taking a look at that. So we have a, a team of about three reps that, that work our inbound network as well. Okay. And where do the majority of your leads come from? Are they coming from inbound? Are they coming from outbound? Where's the vast majority of these uh, leads coming from? That's a, I, we have a great healthy mixture. Our marketing department does a fantastic job at, at driving that top of funnel, and, you know, yeah. getting that MQL, that warmly, that inbound network um, out and distributed. But I, I would like to say that our outbound efforts with what our BDRs are doing, the calls they're, they're making, the, the engagements they're producing based off of their outreach, I, I would say you know it, it's just, just as equal to, to what the marketing efforts are. So I think we have a very healthy mix to what I've seen in past organizations in terms of you know who who contributes most to, to our to our inbound network. I think that part of it, partial partially, it's our outbound efforts and a lot of a lot of this name recognition. And yeah. then in addition to you know what marketing is doing from a campaign standpoint and, and the branding that we do on the back end. That's great. Now for these BDRs and account executives, and then this inbound lead team, do they have a sales playbook? And if so, what's an element of your sales playbook that you feel is best in class or, or top notch? That's a great question. I, I, as an organization, I don't know if we have a refined sales playbook that we always mm -hmm. go back to and kind of point people to. We have a generic resource tool that we use. It's like a beaker that each rep mm -hmm. has. It has access to content, access to trainings, access to kind of knowledgeable base um, that they can use and they can leverage. But in terms of like a refined sales playbook that we point to every single time, I, I think that we're, we're good and we have the bandwidth where we can take it by a case by case. Okay. Um, given the size of our sales department, it's not overwhelming to what we have from a support standpoint with leadership, with management. So I think that a lot of, you know, when they raise their hand and they need to become more learned or more knowledgeable in a certain area, we've been pretty good at, at, at making the bandwidth available to get them taught, to get them up to speed, to get them everything they kind of need to. But in terms of having that like one refined place, I, I don't know if that's something that really exists uh, right now. Yeah. Okay. And and that's the case for a lot of companies. But what's a play or what's an element of your sales process where you feel like, man, we at Hierology, we are just top notch or world class in this? Yeah. I think uh, something that's been developed, especially over the course of my time here, and I've really got to see it take a turn and, and really kick off is the way we've automated our inbound network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this big science between how inbound leads work and, and um, you know, the touch to call ratio and how quickly you need to get to them after it after they've expressed interest. So what we've done is we've kind of partnered with our enablement tool to, to make it so that we have an automated process. As soon as we are starting to get interest in hierology, we're getting them assigned out to our sales reps. They're getting calls, they're getting emails, they're, they're getting kind of the hierology outreach as soon as possible from, from that click, from that sign up, from, mm. from that initial, you know, raise of the hand. Yeah. And what does a typical cadence look like for something like this, right? Someone's demonstrating some interest. Um, what are some of the ways that one and that your either marketing team or your sales team reaches out to some of these warmer leads or in leads showing some interest? Yeah. So we'll build um, cadences, flows, basically an outreach campaign, a ton cool. of different enablement text call, them, a bunch of different stuff, but we have pre-populated steps. Essentially, it's, it, it's a campaign of a number of calls, a number of emails, that are targeted directly towards this warm lead, this MQL, this specific person. And we have them stretching across all verticals of our business. So nice. if a health, if a healthcare warm lead were to come in, they're automatically based on this, this automated action and the reporting we have built up with, it's going to get kicked into this bucket of healthcare warm leads. It's going to get round robined out and it's going to get worked appropriately with the correct content assigned to that segment the, of that population. That's awesome. So if I was a healthcare lead, I mean, is it safe to say that if I express some interest, I'm going to 
are you working on multiple different channels and should I anticipate like 15 different attempts at me to try to get me to call back or try to visit or try to book a demo? Uh, give the people some yeah. numbers on what something like that would look like. I think that's the beauty and kind of the insanity. Into it. Yeah. The, best <laughs> the best practices between like, hey, it takes X amount of calls and Y amount of emails. Yeah. No one's going to know that. And it's going to change from vertical, from vertical to model to model. So I think being able again to be understanding of those results, read the data in real time, make sure that you're aggregating enough of it before you make an actionable solution. So I think a lot of that has to do with A-B testing. Like if we have a, an inkling that, you know, a call step might perform better than, or excuse me, a call email might perform a little bit better than an email call, we'll build out another mirror flow and we'll, we'll test that. We'll, we'll, we'll get the data before we start to kind of just start changing things ad hoc, you know, a swing of the hip and, and just kind of just, out of pure gut instinct. I think that we, we leverage the data, we, we rely on it and we, we understand its value. So being awesome. able to aggregate that and then make that actionable is huge on our end. Yeah, making that push towards data and really being a data focused sales organization, I think is, I mean, that's been the trend I think we've seen over the past two, three, five years, even uh, maybe even a little bit longer than that. And that's definitely, I think, going to be the trend moving forward. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Yeah, I, I think it's going to get more and more important with, yeah. with how automated outreach goes out. Yes. I, I'm sure you get, you know, five to six and maybe upwards of 10 emails that all look the same in your inbox every day. And I think mm -hmm. that. Leveraging that data, understanding how to segment based off that data is going to help provide that more personalized outreach for businesses that still have to play that volume game. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, Matthew, let's close here with the final five. Um, so these are going to be rapid fire questions. You give me the answer. I'll ask the question. Ready? All right. All right. Favorite sales book? Oh, favorite sales book? Transparency Sale by Todd Capone. Don't tell him I told you that, though. That's a good one. All right. Question number two, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you first got into sales? Um, I think patience is a virtue. Someone <laughs> who came from a sales background, I always wanted to grow, um, you know, 10 steps at a time. And I think putting yourself in the right place in the right position to kind of get that knowledge topically is pretty important because you can't rush some things. Totally agree. All right. Uh, favorite sales related movie. Oh, favorite sales related movie is is it cheesy if i say wolf of wall street i think it's a little cheesy but i'm, I'm gonna go with the wolf of wall street yeah go with your first answer there you go <laughs> best purchase of 2020 under a hundred dollars that is great i'm gonna go with my my work stress balls i got a pack of three for 19 dollars on amazon and they've been getting put to work so yeah i could imagine that that company's stock has probably raised you know a thousand fold <laughs> this past year and the final uh fifth question here favorite follow on social Favorite follow on social? That's a great question. Uh, I, I love Taylor Offer on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. He seems to have kind of one of those buzzy, like marketing LinkedIn approached uh, profiles, but he, he does give some good advice. And I think that there, there, there's some good uh, value to be had out of there. Awesome. Uh, where can our listeners connect with you, Matthew? Connect with me on my LinkedIn, um, Matthew Vortigara out of Chicago. You'll see me right next to the Hyrology page. All right. Well, I will put it in the uh, show notes. That's Matthew Volteraga with Hierology. Matthew, thank you so much for being on Inside the Playbook. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Mark. Thank you.